speaking of jazz, I'm going to improvise tonight. All right. I, I have an intro to uh, my remarks, but there's no end. <laughs> so we'll figure oh, it when really we're done together. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> to begin, I wanted to call everyone's attention to this poster I had made. Uh, to call attention to the fact that African Americans have been in Albion now for 170 years. Uh, when I started doing some research in the 70s, it was commonplace for some of my contemporaries to come up to me and say, uh, be sure to mention, you know, my, my auntie because she was the first <laughs> black person to have a job on Superior Street. And I said, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're 100 years too late. Uh, and so that, <clears throat> that's been repeated. And so I wanted to make sure that I called attention to that. There have been published things, uh, one article in the Journal of Albion, and there was a second one. And in both articles, one said the first black was here in 1906, the other one said it. They all, we all came after the Civil War, none of which is correct. So my research is based uh, on census data. So 1850 is where it starts. Now for this long history, uh, it naturally falls into two parts. The first part <coughs> extends from 1850 to 1950. 15, and the second part starts in 1916 and continues through the present. I'm going to jump ahead of my story a little bit, and then I'll back up and explain things. The African American population in the late 1800s um, <clears throat> never exceeded, I think, about 35 uh, in census reports. And in the 1910 census, that population had dwindled to eight people. In the night, around 1915 or 13 in a uh, city directory, I found a couple of entries, and so that eight may have actually increased to 10 by 1915. And then uh, the, great, the great event takes place. You look at 1910, there are eight blacks in Albion. You look at 1920, and there are 696. Wow. Exactly. Where, what, what brought that about? A so when we get to that point, I'll explain it. But to begin, I want to talk about what the people were doing in the late 1800s, and to what extent is there any evidence that talks about a sense of community among that small group of African Americans. <clears throat> uh, a little background on Albion. Uh, it developed rapidly from 1830 through 1880. Uh, in 1836, the uh, Albion Company was formed by people like Jesse Crow, J. Frost, D.S. Bacon, and Tenny Peabody. And they bought up three-fourths of what is Albion and laid out the village flat. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, 1839, they gave 60 acres to the Westland uh, Seminary to, to, for a site of learning, which is now Albion College. And uh, they later <clears throat> gave some additional land so the students would have a place sort of a, a grassy place to lounge around. Uh, <clears throat> in the mid-1840s, uh, the railroad and telegraph reached Albion, and manufacturing started to develop in Albion as well, and Albion started building its educational uh, system in the 1830s. So by the time the first African Americans uh, arrived, Albion is in a period of continuous and rapid development, both economically and educationally. 
as to those first people. They, in the 1850 census, they list uh, three blacks, H.B. Randolph, Mary Randolph, and Albert Randolph. Michigan was doing census counts off year. So they would do 1854, 1864. And so in 1854, uh, in the Michigan census count, they listed six, but there were no names. But uh, I did find a news article much later that identified those additional three people as Mr. Solomon Hurst, his wife Harriet, and his son Solomon. Uh, <clears throat> later census data, uh, federal data, uh, indicates that Mr. Hurst had been born in Tennessee, moved to Canada, married, fathered a son, who the son was born in Canada around 1848, and then they moved to Albion. Uh, and this is one of those examples of blacks who left the states lived in Canada for a while and came back. Looking at the census data from 1860 to 1900, uh, 1860 there were 22 blacks in Albion, 1870, 26, 1880, 33, the 1890 records were destroyed, and in 1900 there were 23, and as I already mentioned, by 1910 they were down to ten, uh, eight. In terms of what they were doing, of all those people who were mentioned in census reports, there were 57 who were identified with some kind of job or being in school. And of the 57, 11 were barbers. <laughs> so it's not unreasonable to assume that their patrons were white by and large. Uh, nine were laborers, seven were housekeepers, six domestics or house servants, uh, two teamsters, four cooks, and I'm not giving all of them. Um, I, what I did find interesting is uh, there was one each of porter, painter, and an engineer, a black engineer, yeah. Uh, and two were attending uh, school. Now, talking about those barbers, this Solomon Hurst, who I mentioned, would be the most successful, uh, probably businessman, black businessman, in the period. Uh, it was said of him, in his day, he was the leading barber of the city, and all the older male citizens were his patrons. Uh, within four years of his arrival, he was advertising his services on the front page, of local newspapers and maintaining his shop on Superior Street. So he was on Superior Street long before my friends in the 1960s. In uh, <clears throat> trying to trace uh, his movement, he had a business uh, at number six, East Erie, upstairs, number two, in the Howard Block on the second floor, in 1869, he was at 30 South Superior, and in 1883, uh, 12 Superior Street. So he was moving all around, but always downtown. Uh, from his start in 1851, uh, his business flourished for over 30 years. In 1860, his real estate was listed as being worth $1,000. And it was said, he was said to have possessed considerable property, but lost it through a series of misfortunes, unspecified. Mm -hmm. Around 1883, he became disabled to the extent that he was moved to the county house in Marshall, where he died September 7, 1895. Uh, knew the, of his death did not reach Albion, until authorities at the county house had interred the remains. But his colored friends here in Albion disinterred the body and on Wednesday buried him in his own lot in Riverside Cemetery. Mm 
And I mention this because this is clearly some evidence of a sense of community. When the African Americans in Albion found out that he'd been buried but at the county house, they went, tug him up, and brought him back to Albion where he belonged. Uh, he was the longest residing uh, African American, 44 years of that group. There were others in the period, uh, David Williamson and Charles McDonald, also barbers, uh, first appear in the 1870 census and remain until after 1900. Uh, <clears throat> Williams, uh, Williamson actually died in March of 1906. Samuel Johnson was a stonemason, uh, appears first in the 1870 census, and he died in 1905. So people were staying around. Uh, <clears throat> John Watson is the only African American from Almion to serve in the Civil War. He enlisted October 22nd of 1863 and was mustered out September 30th, 1865. Came back to Albion and remained here until he died in November 14th of 1900. Uh, there was a woman, Zelia O'Neill, who lived in the same house as Watson. Uh, she appears in the 1880 census and she remained also until 1905. And the evidence suggests that several of the early residents and their families, they, they came, they found work, they stayed, but upon the death of the head of the household, the younger people uh, chose not to stay. And I actually found in the Journal of Albion article, uh, that part of the article seems to be correct, and it talks about um, <clears throat> this situation where the head of the household died and all of uh, his children and the rest of his family chose not to remain uh, in Albion. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there's a change uh, in the complexion of the barbers. Uh, in the city directory for 1885, three of the six barbers uh, were African American. By 1901, all six barbers were white. And by 1913, all seven were white. So clearly, the black barbers are not staying and they're being replaced. There's also evidence <coughs> um, of, of this sense of community where, uh, aside from the few domestic servants who actually lived with the white family that they work for. Uh, there are instances where you see uh, blacks are uh, living as a family in a dwelling, and sometimes there'll be an additional child who's listed as living there, but it's not a relative. And sometimes it'll be a single male living there who is listed as an apprentice uh, to the person. Other evidence of a sense of community uh, was, for example, in 1858, Black sponsored a dance on New Year's Eve at Peabody House, and a second dance was scheduled for later at the Knapps House. In 1874, in the minutes of the Common Council meeting, November 11, 1874, the Marshal was instructed, quote, to inquire into facts in relation to the title of property known as the colored church property. And the following month at the next meeting, uh, the marshal was again instructed to repair the sidewalk in front of the grounds known as colored church property. So clearly, um, <clears throat> they were interested in having their own church and had purchased the land. I have not yet found out exactly where that is. I suspect it's going to be on Center Street, but uh, that's for later. Uh, <clears throat> in the newspapers, our articles, uh, blacks were always identified by race, no matter what the 
the issue. Now, as a researcher, that's great. Because <laughs> then I can find out who's who and who's doing what. Uh, but that was not their purpose. <laughs> uh, these articles were really sensationalized, and this, this is my favorite. Uh, <clears throat> this is from 1891. It says, the, color, the colored population got into a general fight <laughs> on Center Street last Saturday, all because somebody was understood to have made a naughty speech about somebody. <laughs> Does it end there? <laughs> the battle involved about 20 persons of various sexes. <laughs> this is 1891. How many do we have? <laughs> and they say something about, you know, it waged warm and loud. And that's the conclusion of this general <laughs> communal community fight. There was one woman who uh, was actually convicted or charged with something and admitted to it and was fined seven dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> so from the whole community in various sexes, we have one person. Uh, even when advertising entertainment, care was taken to identify non-white persons as separate from the general population. One such headline announced the coming of a colored comical concert. Uh, it was, quote, book for the opera house and would consist of plantation melodies, songs, and dances, and close with the comic operetta, Carve That Possum. Carve That Possum? That Possum. That Possum. D -A -T. That possum. <laughs> That's the way it's in the paper. The article noted that the Sears Austin Johnson, Hanfis Williamson, and Harrison, local colored singers, uh, would also participate. Uh, so, again, there, there is this sense of community that's coming from within the black community itself, and they're being identified as being separate from the general population uh, in the paper. So, population is declining as, as we approach uh, the close of the century, and it's down to eight by 1910. Mm -hmm. And then we really uh, get into uh, an interesting period, and I'm really gonna improvise for this. Um, if one takes Albion as a hub and uses a 10 or 11 mile radius and draws a circle, you will find that Albion is surrounded by communities like Concord, Homer, Marshall, and Springport. And within that circle, Albion is what I call a demographic anomaly. And I will explain. Uh, looking at the census data for 2010 uh, in those communities, Marshall was 95.9% uh, white and 0.3% black. The Homer population was 97.8% white and 0.02% black. And Concord was 97.9% white and 0.1% uh, black. Then you come to Albion, <laughs> and there are no 90s. Albion is 61.05% white and 33.22% black. This is the 2010. So... 1910. 1910? Or no, 2010? 2010. 2010. Okay. Yeah. And this, this anomaly in the demographics is set in place uh, in, beginning in 1916. And I gave you that astounding population increase and, and now I have to explain it. Uh, it's, Albion has a fascinating story. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. And World War I started in 1914, 
and contingent from 1918. And because of that, and German control of the Atlantic, approximately one million European immigrant workers who had been coming to the U.S. every year were stopped. At the same time that that happened, the northern industry was gearing up to produce war material to ship to Europe. And so they needed their factories going full tilt at the very moment they're losing their labor supply. And at first, some people said, you know, we really have a labor problem. But the bright, the bright guys in the industry and the railroads say, nah, you don't have a labor problem. You have a transportation problem. And I'll explain. It's a Pepsi bottle, but it really is just water. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what they meant by that was this. Northern people knew by in large numbers what was going on in the South. And these Northern industrialists said, look, all we have to do is provide transportation. Blacks in the South would be happy to get out of there and come work in our factories for better wages, certainly uh, a better sense of freedom and educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so what were they talking about? And I, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I want everybody to understand what they were talking about. For blacks in the South uh, in 1914, if we go back to 1900, the turn of the century, Public lynchings of blacks were like 105, 106. And when I say public, I mean things that were advertised in the paper, after church, you know, or you'd bring a, a poster maybe and say, after church, get the family, get a picnic basket, come out to the meadow, uh, we're gonna lynch two niggers. And that was Sunday afternoon, good Christian entertainment. So that's what the northern industrialists understood. Uh, no voting for blacks. There was something known as racial etiquette that was not really written into law, but understood. Blacks did not look white, people's in, white people in the eye. You could not even accidentally bump into a white woman. Uh, and very, various things. Uh, you had to wear a hat in the presence of white women, all that kind of stuff. And if you didn't, the punishment could range from anything from a public whipping all the way up to death. There was peonage, sharecropping, tenant farming, and the convict lease system. Uh, and if you don't know anything about it, just go to YouTube and write convict lease system. And there's a, there was a guy who wrote for the Wall Street Journal. His last name is Blackman, M-O-N. And he was not some radical journalist. I mean, he was writing for the Wall Street Journal. And, but he was in the South investigating something and really stumbled on this story and wound up writing a book called Slavery by Another Name. Uh, and in the great old state of Mississippi in 2020, they still have, I just saw a thing on Yahoo, they, they have debtor prisons where if you are in debt for whatever, you go to prison and the judges will set up what your fine is to get out and of course, you don't have any way to pay it because you're in. That's why you're in debt. So you can go to McDonald's and work it off. You just work your shift. Somebody else gets your money. That's called slavery in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then there was the rape of black women, and I already mentioned lynching. And before you mean, I leave, you mean this, white women? Huh? You mean white women? No, no, black women. Black women? Yeah, yeah. 
all the guys running around saying that intermarriage was a terrible thing for having plenty of sex with black women. Mm -hmm. And uh, a teacher colleague of mine a few years ago, well, maybe several by now, time is flying. <laughs> uh, she uh, is into genealogy and had been out to Salt Lake City and come back. And mm. She stopped me in the hall and she, she said, Bobby, guess what we found, you know, and she said, uh, she said, I didn't realize that all of the black people in the United States, you know, 70% of them are not pure African or anything. I said, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, so where'd that come from? And I'll leave you to answer. My last point is, I mentioned this because it's appropriate for the time, but I've also sensed over the years that people think we get amnesia when we move. And that's not true. If you grew up in the South, and this will fit in later, and you move north, you take all your memory with you. Mm -hmm. And it really uh, travels much closer to our own time than you would imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a student in 10th or 11th grade, I think she was a 10th grader, and in lieu of doing, uh, writing a, a lengthy research term paper, I gave her the option of doing a, a serious taped interview with her grandmother. Mm. And so we met after school to discuss what, what, she, what are you gonna ask Granny, you know? And I said, do you think she would respond to it if you asked her if she ever witnessed a lynching? Because the grandma was really old. Mm. And she said, okay, you know, I'll do it. And she did. <clears throat> and you know, we use the word lynching, if you like, even me, I grew up seeing cowboy movies and every now and then there would be an implied lynching, and they're very clean. You just ride out to a tree, throw a rope over somebody's head, and hit the horse. Not too bad. That is not what blacks experience. So this girl...